I want to talk about the period of time when the Titan submersible went missing with only 40 hours of breathable air on board. Now, once people found out that one of the occupants was a billionaire, the onslaught of jokes and memes began, reminding us all once more that humanity maybe doesn't deserve internet access. Now that's what I call music, Submarine Edition is here. With the hottest tracks like Drownin', hit single, Don't Hold Your Breath, unforgettable hits like No Air. Honestly, the only memes that really made me laugh were like the wholesome ones of like, if it was my man in the ocean. There were also a few like, me finding out billionaires are in the sea and people just like straight up strutting into the water, which I really enjoyed. Yes, girlies, go get them. I digress. Now, the countdown began to find the submersible before it ran out of air, and as the hours went by and the memes got darker and darker, a debate began to appear on the internet begging the question, is this funny or a horrific lack of empathy? Now, if you're not familiar with what happened, Ocean Gate Expedition operates a submersible called the Titan for tourists who are willing to pay $250,000 a trip to see the Titanic wreckage. Now, apparently prior to the tragedy, the Titan actually made like 13 trips to the remains of the Titanic. I don't understand who is paying for this or why or how it became a thriving business, but whatever. Now on June 18th, five people were aboard the Titan. Chief executive of Ocean Gate Expeditions, Stockton Rush, British billionaire and explorer, Hamish Harding, Pakistani businessman, Shahzad Dawood and his 19 year old son, Suleiman, and French maritime expert, Paul Henry Nargiolet, who had been on more than 35 dives to the Titanic wreck site. Now, shortly after the Titan went missing, some absolutely insane details came out. Most notably, that it was controlled by a repurposed Logitech controller. You've taken a completely new approach to the sub design, and it's all run with this game controller and these touch screens. So, if you want to go forward, you press forward. If you want to go back, you go back. Turn left, turn right, go down, go up. I'm sorry, I'm like expecting this man to tell me that if I hit like A, B, A, B, or X, Y, X, Y, or some kind of combo, that the sub will like tuck and roll or something, because this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. But okay, let's continue. And it's Bluetooth, so I can hand it to anybody. And it's meant for a 16 year old to throw it around and super durable. We keep a couple of spares on board just in case. Like what? I would not trust that thing to like help me win Super Smash Brothers, let alone navigate me through the ocean. This shocked all of us. And of course, only fueled a new vertical of memes. Oh my God! No, you didn't! <laughs> it's incredibly disrespectful and way too soon. But when I looked a little bit more into it, I, I kind of got some conflicting info. So apparently in 2017, the Navy announced it was going to implement Xbox controllers on submarines to operate photonic masks, which are similar to periscopes. But then Steve Wright, who's an associate professor of aerospace engineering at the University of West of England, said that, yeah, while many aircraft and sea vessels are partially controlled by what looks like a video game controller, the actual devices would be more advanced and reliable. Wright was shown a photo of the Titan's Logitech controller, and he said, and I'm quoting, I've never seen anything like that. And that he would expect that the real submersible controller would have a reliability of about a thousand times that of the game's handset. Now beyond the controller fiasco, it was revealed that much of the Titan itself had been built with off the shelf parts or discounted materials. The hull was made from used cut price carbon fiber from a Boeing that was past its airplane shelf life. And the capsule was bolted shut from the outside and could not be opened from the interior. The list goes on. The negligence of safety procedures by CEO Stockton Rush were almost criminal. And his comments, particularly, you're remembered for the rules you break, did not age well. The hubris. Now, it came out also that the Titan was not even certified to reach the levels of deep sea where the Titanic lay. And apparently, Rush had been warned for years by leaders in the submersible craft industry about the possibility of catastrophic problems with the Titan's design. Like, I want you to take a look at James Cameron's $10 million submersible compared to the Titan. It's clear that Rush cut so many corners, he was a full-on circle. 
All of this, of course, meant that the memes wrote themselves. I mean, the architecture was just too good for people to resist. A billionaire who paid a quarter of a million dollars to deep sea dive with a negligent CEO for the pleasure of viewing a century old, similarly avoidable tragedy? It felt so poetic. I mean, the writers this year were really going off, let the strike end. But what I find really interesting about this situation is how the public's empathy shifted based on the context and perspective that they were viewing this event through. Now, on the one hand, the sort of like lack of empathy was so obvious when you looked at this from a class perspective. I think online creator Josh Doss articulated this really well. What could have possibly happened in this, these last 100 years to create a condition where millions of working class people had almost no empathy for a billionaire in despair. What could have happened? Where could this lack of empathy come from? And could it be that poor and middle class, lower class people see the wealth that their labor creates being profiteered on at near oligarchy levels? So much so that they themselves are paywalled from the very things that their labor is supposed to provide them, like healthcare, like education, like access to education. Their living conditions are being commodified to, to such an extreme level that they don't even know if they can live in the places that they grew up in. And all of this is happening at the hands of millionaires and billionaires that are taking too much from what they're not creating. Could it be that? We all know this on an intellectual level, but I am a numbers gal and I wanna be armed with concrete information. So I want us to quickly take a look Look at the numbers to really understand the class divide that fuels this lack of empathy. This is going to be a lot of numbers and facts and statistics, but just stay with me for this portion, right? I want to paint you a really accurate picture for you to understand why people were making some of the darkest memes we've seen in a long time. Now, according to the New York Times, the federal minimum wage has risen just once since 1996. In July 2009, it was raised to 725. But when you adjust that number for inflation, the minimum wage has actually declined by 26%. And the Economic Policy Institute says that if the minimum wage kept up with a growing economy, it would be much, much higher. At 1885, in 2016, over seven years ago. Now, in comparison, banks are making record profits. According to The New Yorker in 2021, JP Morgan made a post-tax profit of $48.3 billion. That is 35% more than they made pre-pandemic in 2019, which was $36 billion. Also, fun fact, bank overdraft fees did not exist until the 1990s, and they now make banks $8 billion in profit annually. Since 2010, banks have taken over $460 billion in overdraft fees. Because yes, let's charge people money for having no money. As if that wasn't insulting enough, the CEO of TCF Bank really had the audacity to buy a yacht and name it Overdraft. Now the wealth gap between America's richest and poorer families more than doubled from 1989 to 2016. According to Time, since 1980, the top 10% of earners have seen an income growth of 144%, while the bottom half of earners have only seen 20. And Pew Research shows that the highest earning 20% of families made more than half of all US income in 2018. Sociologist Matthew Desmond, who won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize for his book, Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City has now written a new book called Poverty by America, where he explores why exactly the United States poverty rate has not improved in 50 years. Analyzing data from the US Census Bureau and other sources, he reported one in 18 Americans live in deep poverty or a subterranean level of scarcity, and that the racial wealth gap is as large as it was in the 60s. When you look at the wealth inequality in the United States, much less around the world, the lack of empathy from the public for the Titan submersible is not only understandable, you start to feel that way a little bit too, right? Like these people paid a quarter of a million dollars to take a ride in an expired sardine can to visit a watery grave? The memes are starting to make sense to me. And I'm sure it felt good to a lot of people to see someone like Stockton, who prioritized profit over people's safety, potentially get his due. It felt good for the public to think that billionaire Hamish Harding, who paid a quarter million dollars, which to him is like $10, get his own personal fire festival. It felt like poetic justice, it felt like good riddance, and dare I say, it felt a little funny. But what if I told you that that billionaire had two children 
And then what if I showed you pictures of his children? And what if you were looking at a child who would grow up without a father? What really shifted the public's empathy was, of course, not just imagining yourself in that submersible running out of air for those 40 hours, but also the humanization of everyone on board. Of course, all the occupants had loved ones. They had families. Hamish left behind two children, both who would grow up without him, and photos of his son Giles quickly circulated the internet, given that Giles' entire Instagram was devoted to adventures that he and his father shared, and the pride and inspiration he took from his dad. Now, there was a controversy when Harding's stepson, Brian, revealed that he attended a Blink-182 concert while his dad was missing. Even more odd was his statement on Facebook. It might be distasteful being here, but my family would want me at the Blink-182 show as it is my favorite band and music helps me in difficult times. I miss you, and I'm so sorry. Yeah, my dad's on the sub tonight. <laughs> If that wasn't bizarre enough, he then tweeted at a band member writing, at Tom DeLonge, my stepdad is in the missing sub at the Titanic site. I'm here at the San Diego show for support, thanks. Black heart emoji, prayer hands emoji. But I think all that this incident does is show us that like everyone on board really had a family, you know what I mean? Because family isn't this idyllic fantasy, it's shit like this. Your stepson getting in a Twitter feud with Cardi B about whether or not he should be sitting at home crying while you are trapped and lost underwater. But moving on, what about the, the father and the son duo on board? You know, like 19-year-old Solomon and his father Shazad. A mother was now grieving her son and husband, and it also eventually came out weeks later that it was supposed to be her on the submersible. It was supposed to be Shazad and I going down. Um, and but then I stepped back and gave the space to Suleiman because he really wanted to go. I cannot fathom the amount of guilt that that woman now has to work through. And Shazad had a daughter, Alina, who would now also grow up fatherless. And what about Paul Henry Nargiolet, who was known as Mr. Titanic? For all intents and purposes, this man was just doing his job, a job he was well known and highly respected for, who holds the record for man submersible dives to the wreck of the Titanic site. He collected over 5,000 artifacts from the ship. And when asked by a colleague why on earth he would dive to the Titanic 35 times, he told her, Every time I go, I see something different. This passionate, ambitious, and courageous man left behind a wife, two daughters, a son, a stepson, and four grandchildren. It seems a little less funny when we go from that macro class lens to the personal micro lens. The memes, oh, they seem a little more callous now, a little more yikes, and a little bit more like maybe we're not targeting our justified rage about wealth inequality towards these people but relishing in the suffering of others and the narrative that has formed around this incident? Because if we're really angry about the wealth disparity, right? If we're really identifying as the middle, lower, poorer class who are rising against the upper crust of society, then why did none of us really give a shit about the other missing watercraft that happened the week before? Now, as rescuers raced against the clock to find a handful of wealthy people and explorers upon the Titan, another disaster was happening at sea, but receiving a fraction of coverage and compassion from the public. Now, just a week before, a sinking fishing boat called Adriana, crowded with hundreds of migrants and asylum seekers trying to get from Libya to Italy, received significantly less resources and attention. Thousands more articles were published about the Titan than the migrant boat, despite this boat having an estimated 596 people. That's 591 more people than the Titan. Those on the fishing boat were believed to be crammed by human traffickers and were allegedly charged around $8,000 per person for an illegal voyage to Europe. 350 of those on board were Pakistani nationals. Pakistan has been dealing with a complete economic meltdown, with inflation being an insane 38%. So many people on board were risking their lives to seek better futures. And out of the estimated 596 on board, including many children, only 104 were rescued. This is considered one of the deadliest maritime disasters in Europe in decades. So why was there such a disparity in the response, in our, in our response to these two nautical disasters? Why did we care more about making fun of the potential death of a billionaire than we did about feeling outraged about the death of hundreds of migrants? Why wasn't there a similar response when last month, the New York Times published video footage that showed masked men putting asylum seekers, look at him, he's putting this tiny baby out to sea. The Greek Coast Guard abandoned them on an inflatable fucking raft. 
I really regret choosing a Greece vacation. She will not be going back. She will not be spending her money there. You know, I'm not gonna lie. Looking at the photos between the five people on board the Titan and the migrants upon the Adriana and the inflatable raft, I can't help but wonder what psychological factors are at play that make us, the public, so much more interested in using our time to make fun of the tragedy of five people while completely ignoring the tragedy of thousands. Does our outrage over the submersible only exist because we feel slighted by the rich? Do we lend ourselves to view it more because it feels better to exist in moral superiority and a sense of justice than it does to look at the faces of human suffering? And look, I also get compassion fatigue is real, right? Like I read once that we are exposed to more traumatic stories in a single day than someone from the 1700s would experience in their entire life. It is true, desensitization is real. We cannot care about everything and every day, every second, the news cycle rages on, showing us more and more and more tragedy. It is impossible to care about it all and stay sane. But I think what the Titan submersible showed us is that we can really care about something together, that we do have the ability to shift public focus, that our attention when amplified and magnified and memed can be extraordinary, albeit terrifying and dark as humanity does. And I think it's important to ask ourselves, when I am feeling a lack of empathy about a situation, why is that? What is this communicating to me about myself? And is it better perhaps to redirect my focus to someone who deserves it? I'm Anna Arcana. Thank you to the patrons who supported today's episode. And thank you as always to my father, my biological dad, Squarespace, for sponsoring today's video. If you guys are not familiar with my dad yet, I don't know where you've been, because Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform to build a gorgeous website, sell your products, and engage with your audience. If you're like me and you don't know anything about how to code, Squarespace is perfect. They have beautiful and professional website templates that you can have as a starting point, and then you customize that to your specific brand and aesthetic. On the outside, it looks very sophisticated sophisticated, but on the back end, it's drag and drop and easy and intuitive to build and just as easy to keep updated. You can also create an online store and sell custom merch. So for me, that's my online guidebook about how I do my inner work. But for you, that may look more like physical products, services, or classes. Whatever it is, the creator economy is booming, baby. And we are all here to have a livelihood doing what we're passionate about. You can go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and whenever you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com Anna, and use code Anna for 10% off your purchase of a website or domain.